So what we'll do is just set up a very um, straightforward situation, two people having a conversation across a table. And let's imagine for the sake of argument, it's a three camera shoot. We've got to do a wide and close ups at the same time. So what I would usually do is I'd start off with doing the wide shot, get one camera on the wide and then the over the shoulders could be mid shot. So you're not right into the face. So you can get away with the shadows being, the eyes being a little bit shadowy as they would have to be from the wide shot. But then when we go in for the closer cross shoot, you'll see what we do. So I'm going to start by putting the egg crate back on the octodome. Well, I'm Tim. I'm a director of photography. I spend most of the time working in television drama series, pretty much 99% of what I do. I've uh, been working in the industry now for about 25 years starting out as a camera assistant and clapper loader and working my way up to director of photography. So I work for the main broadcast uh, networks, BBC, Channel 4, ITV, and now the, I guess the cable companies are coming on stream, starting to work for them too. And it's a great business to be in, a lot of variety of work. You never know where you're going to be from one day to the next, and uh, there's, it's been an exciting career. When I began lighting, the equipment we had at our disposal was fairly rudimentary. It was hard lights. There were very few proprietary types of soft lighting instruments in existence. So in order to create soft light, we'd bounce it or shine a light through a diffusion frame. It was very effective and it had worked for decades uh, beautifully for cinematographers. Uh, and it still worked very well for myself. I would say it was probably about not sure, 10 years ago now, eight or nine years ago, that Dado Light came out with their Octodome. And a gaffer introduced me to it. And it was a, it really felt like this was the light that I'd been looking for for many years, apart from it being tungsten and soft. You know, any, anybody can make a tungsten soft light, but the design of it, the, the big source, the narrow profile, the very controlled egg crate system to stop any spill. It was very light, maneuverable. It just seemed like the perfect, perfect soft tungsten light to use. So I carried that with me on every job. But I still would use them fairly conventionally, just on stands as a, you know, as a, a sort of a key light like this, just to light the faces. And one day I was in a, uh, working on a drama and we were filming in a very, very tiny location. It was a tiny sitting room in a small, uh, small house on a council estate, uh, low ceilings. And we had to do a sh quite a complicated shot that involved seeing one of the, seeing one of the cast reflected in a picture frame, which was reflecting the whole room and any lamp that I put on the floor would have been reflected in the picture frame and it, the shot wouldn't have worked because it had to develop off that reflection to the real character. So it needed, I needed an overhead light. I thought, well, why not try the Octodome? It's, it's low prof, shallow profile enough that I'll be able to fit it up into the ceiling. It'll get the coverage. It's got the egg crate, so it's not going to spill on the wall. So in a tiny room, it's going to give me a nice little pool of soft light concentrated in the middle of the room with no fuss. So that's what we did, and it worked fantastically. It made me realize very, <laughs> made me realize quite how versatile this lamp was. But apart from the versatility, it, it provided a beautiful quality of soft light that was just impossible to achieve with anything else. The Octodome, just, you could just sling it straight onto a fairly lightweight boom arm flied over the top and the job was done very quickly and very elegantly. I mean, I've got, this is that, this is that room that I was describing, the very small sitting room where we use the octodome over the top. So you can see that we've got the lamp stand behind the sofa, boom arm and the uh, lamp, soft light, no, keeps the light flagged off the walls and there's nothing else on the floor. And this is the, this is the scene that the film, film scene. It's a very quick scene. So the shot starts here, and you don't quite know what it is. It's a fairly abstract um, close-up. You've got a photograph of a, a young girl, and then the reflection, an out-of-focus reflection in a piece of glass on the other side of the frame. And the shot develops. 
pull focus to person on the right there. So she's obviously in the distance. This is the this is the woman in the other room, top lit by the octodome. But we couldn't have anything, as I described, we couldn't have anything on the floor because it would have been reflected A in this photograph here and B in this glass cabinet. So it cuts away. And then we cut into the room with a little uh, track in on um, on the woman. And that's the, you can see the sort of effect of the top light from the octodome. I must have had a little bit of cool fill coming from the window to suggest a bit of night light. But the, basically the only lighting was the top light and a practical. Um, and it just worked, uh, worked very nicely. But that was the first time I used it. And then that was a real breakthrough moment because I suddenly realized that I could photograph a scene in a tiny room really well without struggle. Because it's always, it's always much harder to shoot a small space than a big space. And everybody's always on top of each other in a small room and people get irritated and frustrated and you're bumping into things and knocking things over and the actors get, uh, the actors get put off their stride. But if you can step back and get one big soft source to do the job well in a small room, you know, I, was, I, was, I knew I was onto a winner there and, uh, and I've been doing it ever since. Well, on that same job, that this was the job that I, the small room job, I used it again, um, you can see in this configuration here, it's slightly bigger, bigger space. Classic situation where an octodome would be used, and in fact this is a daylight one, because it was a day scene, so it was the 400 HMI data, but exactly the same physical footprint of lamp. Stand, boom arm, table, everyone lit nicely around the edge of the table with good contrast on their faces and apart from the one place on set where the stand for the boom arm is we were able to use two cameras shooting everybody in all different all the get all the different eye lines and they were all very pleasingly lit and also the the speed of setting up and the the speed of being able to achieve four or five setups consecutively uh, in a short amount of time and the advantage of being able to light in this way is that you can move from a, a wide shot to a close-up and use two or three cameras all at the same time without really having to do any relighting at all. I mean, I'll show you in the demonstration the amount of relighting I would need to do for a close-up, but it's pretty minimal. What I'm setting up here is a typical situation as per the still photographs that I showed you, the references from um, some of the scenes that I'd lit in uh, shows that I'd worked on previously. Uh, just showing off how the octodome works in a, a simple cross the table conversation scene where you've got, well here only two people, but ostensibly it could work equally well with four or more. But we're shooting this on three cameras. There's a big wide shot on the A camera here showing the whole scene, and then uh, mid shot on camera B here, and a complementary mid shot on camera C here. I'm not going in too close at this point. From a lighting point of view, you can only go so far in terms of matching the light in the eyes between wide shots and close up. So if you go on, a, if you shoot a wide and mid shots, you can get away with it. Um, and then when we go in for close-ups, I'll make a few very quick little adjustments and then the close-up lighting will match. This is where the octodome comes into its own. You get a very nice concentrated pool of soft light over a table. Characters are uh, interestingly lit. Perhaps if you were to go into a big close-up now, it wouldn't be that flattering because there'd be quite big shadows under the eyes, but in a wide and a mid shot, it looks perfectly all right. All the lights in the background, they're just for a little bit of uh, a bit of decoration, I would say. It's nothing to do with the lighting of the scene per se, but what, what, you, what, I, have, what I bear in mind in a low-key lighting situation, if I'm lighting from above, it's, it's fantastic to get such nice lighting on the artist's soft top light. And the egg crate's working really well to keep the light off the walls, especially if we were in a small room with pale colored walls, but actually, that can go too far and you can end up with no separation at all and end up with just a, two people in floating around in a black space, which is actually uh, quite a nice position to be in because it means you can 
add lighting to create the mood of the piece rather than feeling like you're constantly having to take it away. So that's why we've just switched on a few little things in the background here and there to give a bit of flavor and texture to the room. So I'm going to ask Josh and Justin just to carry on a little conversation with themselves, just for, just, uh, just for 30 seconds or so, just so we can, so the cameras can see how it looks like, how it looks when uh, people are interacting. Yeah. yeah, end of February, beginning of March. Okay, well that's pretty good guys, thanks very much. Um, we've set the scene nicely, it's a simple scene, but it's a simple scene nicely told. We've got a good wide, two good mid shots, one big soft light, and that's it. Job done. So now all we have to do is some close-ups and the scene's in the can. And whenever I'm on a recce and I go into a space, I've always got probably three things in mind. Will we have reflection problems? Do we need to shoot 360? Do we need to use more than one camera and shoot from different angles? And if the answer is yes to two or all of those, then I know the octodome rigged up above will, will get me through, get me through that, those problems. And I know that that'll, the, sh the, the scene will be able to be shot very uh, simply with that type of lighting. So I'll often, I'll always consider using them, I mean, standard things, say in a, a pub or a bar, restaurant, dinner party, dinner table, those, those types of environments. Basically, the, what, what you have in these situations is you've got this big top light, but actually when you go in close, it can feel a bit, it can feel a bit too toppy and too hard. And uh, we need to make it just a little bit more flattering. I could lower the light a little bit, but that's going to be time consuming and quite a complicated rig and we'd have to get the table out, we'd have to get the artists out, send them away, get the ladders in and drop it all down. And then actually then what happens is the quantity of light changes. Um, and if suddenly the director decides he wants one of the artists to stand up in the scene and walk away, well then you might have the, they might bash their head against the lamp and and you'd have to relight again. So I don't want to do that at all. So what I usually do is I'll get a little, um, we'll rig this, but I'll show you in the hand what I do. I'll bring in a d diffusion frame, probably an F1, and we'll rig it so it's out of shot, not here, because this will be in shot. And we'll just position it somewhere over the artists like that. So it just softens and spreads the light a little bit more, pushes a little bit more in the eyes. And then all we need is a little reflector or a kick to put an eye light in, and that's the job done. I do use it as a key light, yeah. um, but only when there's enough space, because it's a big lamp. So in a big space, I'll use it on a stand. But usually I, um, I tend to light quite naturalistically, so if I'm on a, in a daylight location, I'll light through the windows and just use a bit of poly bounce or something like that. I, I light, I, prefer to have as little hardware on the floor as possible. So, um, therefore I'm less likely to use it on a stand near the actors, but I'll definitely fly one over the top. What I should have mentioned in the olden days, probably the, the nearest thing to, the nearest type of lighting unit to use to get the same color, the same effect would have been a Chinese lantern simple Chinese China ball that you would have flown in over a boom arm, on a boom arm. But the problem with China balls is that they're quite fragile, at least the old ones were, new ones are a bit more robust, but they're quite fragile and they're impossible to skirt and flag in a, in a nice even way, the way you can, the way the egg crate on the octodome focuses the light immediately. You end up with, I mean, the problems I always had with Chinese lanterns is the moment you start draping some sort of skirt on one side of the lamp, it would shift the weight of it and then the whole lamp would tip to one side. Then you put, you put fabric on the other side and it would go too far the other way and you'd end up with a light that never quite distributed the light as evenly as you wanted to. I mean, it, wor it worked and it was fine. We always got there. But we never got there as quickly, simply, efficiently, elegantly, and beautifully as you do with the 
Octodome. And also the, the speed of setting up and the, the speed of being able to achieve four or five setups consecutively uh, in a short amount of time. I'll show you in the demonstration the amount of relighting I would need to do for a close-up, but it's pretty minimal. Now, ah, here we go, boys. So, no, so what we need to do is put the base on this side, so it'll be, so it won't be any, in any of the shot, in any of the shots from the camera. So I think if we put the base in here, the advantage of being able to light in this way is that you can move from a, a wide shot to a close-up and use two or three cameras all at the same time without really having to do any relighting at all. And time saved on set is, uh, is very valuable. That's good. Um, now, do you think you could extend this out a little bit more still? And then let's just lower it from the knocker, so it's just so, so that the frame is flat. Okay. That's pretty good. Okay. Okay, so more recently this year on a, a job actually, which is just which is going to be on this Friday, about the life of career ups and downs of Bobby Moore and Tina Moore in the 1960s and 70s and 1980s. And this was a scene very early on in their marriage at the sort of pub where all the footballers would, footballers and their wives would meet and have drinks um, after a match. And it was a, a pub in, we used location in Manchester. But again, I knew there would be probably easily 20 people in the room. 20 actors in the room doing different things and the camera would have to, we'd be using two cameras. There were there's windows everywhere, glass cabinets, mirrors behind the bar, anything that could reflect a crew member or a camera would and it, they were all there. So I knew that there's other people who can take care of not seeing people reflected but it's up to me to make sure there are no lamps reflected. So I thought, well, again, you know, get the lamps up high, out of the way, big soft source. So this is what we did here. We had three Panora Octodomes rigged, one over the sort of central dance area of the bar, one over the middle area of the pub, and one near the doorway. And so the whole bar area was completely lit, but in a very stylish way, because trouble with this space, again, typical situation you find oneself in. Television drama, you find a location, there's no, there isn't a big design budget to repaint and this pub had white walls. So it's a night scene, white walls, it's going to look horrible if the light's spilling on the walls and if you have soft light up above, yes you're going to light the act as well but you're also going to spread light everywhere and it's not going to look very elegant. The egg crate system on the octodomes works so well it's so controlled you get the light five you get the whole spread of the spread of light from the octodome very evenly but the egg crate is designed that when you're just out of the just out of the principal beam of the light it falls off incredibly fast so we were able to keep all the light off the walls and everyone looked good and we shot a massive page count two cameras comfortably in a day it was a big rig to get the octodomes up into the ceiling. It was a day's pre-rigging from the, the gaff from the lighting department to get them up there. Because I knew the big scene, the really important scene, was the night party scene. I wanted the I wanted tungsten octodomes, because daylight ones would have been too bright and it would have been impossible to control. And they had to be dimmable. So it was just it was a no it was a no-brainer. They had to be tungsten. But then I also knew, well, what am I going to do for the day after the next day? Well, we've got all these day scenes in here. I'm not, I don't have time to change them all to daylight heads. Um, so I thought, well, they're bright enough. So I kept them all as tungsten and I just gelled them all with full blue. And there was quite enough light out of them to do that. And it was a sort of bit of an old fashioned, uh, solution but it it worked absolutely fine i was never short of light in fact i still had to dim them down a little bit too gaffer did such a good job they went in and you can't even see it and you can just see the clips 
here, they went in, they took the um, egg crates off and very carefully cut the gel. Big party scene in a room with low ceilings. Again, <laughs> 30 or 40 people in the room. And the scene, it was a wide ranging scene, people moving around, talking to each other, dancing, and we used Steadicam. So it was Steadicam in this room, going here, there and everywhere, 360 around one character, 360 around another character. There could not be anything on the floor. We did the same system with the octodomes rigged into the ceiling, threw and to remove the, the ceiling pendants and screwed them into battens straight into the ceiling. So you can see here three octodomes and the light was fantastic. It just spread evenly across the whole room, kept the light off the walls and the Steadicam could go wherever he wanted all night long. And we didn't have to, we didn't have a, a single light on the floor except a little bit of Polly following the Steadicam around to put something back in the eyes. We were able to shoot a very elaborate, complex scene really quickly. Steadicam up, Two takes on the wide, two takes on a mid shot, two takes on a close up. Do one take starting at this end of the room, the other take, another take starting that end of the room. By the time you put it all together, you've got the whole scene. <laughs> and everybody feels good when you're working quickly. There's a lot, of, there's a great energy to the performances, there's a good energy to the camera work. If you're constantly having to stop to relight, to reset up, it just can bog down. The, the momentum gets bogged down. And in my opinion, from having made films for a long time, it sort of, the lighting, you know, it sort of doesn't matter what the lighting's like, it doesn't necessarily matter what the camera's like, but if there's a momentum to the shooting, it creates a, a great feeling in the performances, and that's what makes a film good, ultimately. It's all down to the actors, and if the actors can, can be in a comfortable space, it's going to work, and the octodomes always allow the actors to be in a comfortable space.